Well, good morning and welcome to Prairie View Christian Church. I'm looking around the room. I'm Zach, but I think everyone knows that. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you this morning. Uh, we're going to get started with a handful of announcements. First one being that we are hosting another blood drive through Versity Blood Center of Indiana. That's going to be on Tuesday, April 6th here at the church. I am under the impression, if, if you were here at the previous blood drive, you uh, know there were some strange circumstances involving our roof. Um, I'm under the impression we will not be having a new roof put on during this blood drive, so it might be a lot more peaceful. Uh, it's a pretty simple way to be a good neighbor, depending on your relationship to needles and blood. But needless to say, I think this is a way we see our church being able to serve our community, like I said, in a pretty simple way. Another announcement is in regards to our green team, which is basically the group of I kept wanting to say guys, but it's, it doesn't have to be guys, even though I think it's typically just guys, but it's our green team who are our volunteers who are responsible for keeping this place looking like uh, not a jungle, getting out and cutting the grass, taking care of things outside. Um, if you are at all interested in riding around on a professional lawnmower, zero turn lawnmower, then uh, check out the info sign-up sheet out there in the lobby. You can get in contact with Mark Kinsey, the, uh, the goal there is to have teams, four teams, two groups, or four teams of two people rotating weekly. So it's not a huge commitment, but it's an opportunity to get out, maybe listen to a podcast with some, some music, and serve the church in a, in a pretty simple way. Um, other things going on is uh, we're getting ready to wrap up this sermon series called Royal Failures, and we will be going right into Easter with Palm Sunday and then Easter Sunday. Uh, that being said, much like Christmas, we expect more attendance on Easter. And so if you can get RSVPs in for that, that is very, very helpful for us uh, as we prepare to uh, fit this room for whoever might show up. Uh, along with the Easter line of thinking, I want to plug a couple things for our children's ministry. First of all is uh, resurrection eggs. Uh, these were introduced to me i got to give a shout-out to Betty Perdon a couple years ago. Um, and we, as a family, have used them and loved them. We, we, I, along with Theo, made a video last year for our kids using the resurrection eggs. They're very cheap. You can find them online. You can probably find them in a store like Hobby Lobby. I'm just encouraging, if you have young kids, if you're around young kids, if you have grandkids, nieces, nephews, whatever, it's an awesome, awesome little toy that walks through the, the Easter story. Every little kid likes opening eggs. I just want to plug that. The video is still floating around out there on YouTube, and I'm sure will be used again this year for our children and plugging Easter. So I just want to throw that out there. Uh, unfortunately, we're not getting any money kickbacks from Resurrection Eggs, but uh, they are a, a fantastic resource. Uh, speaking of Easter eggs, we do plan on having an Easter egg hunt like we've done in the past for our kids following the service on Easter Sunday. Uh, as we talked about COVID precautions, we kind of basically said this is what they already do after church every Sunday anyways. Now they'll just have eggs to pick up, and so they will be doing that hopefully outside, weather permitting. But if it's anything like the past, we might end up inside having the little hooligans running around doing their thing uh, in the building, picking up eggs. Um, another announcement, and I think the last announcement is we just had an elders meeting this past Thursday night, and we are talking, and we do have an eye on the progress with COVID, and we, are, we do have an eye to what things might look like as things begin to open up. And so if you're wondering, um, don't ask me, <laughs> but as a group, we are coming up with a plan, and, and like I said, we, we are certainly paying attention to those kinds of things, and ultimately considering how we can best serve our church in, in what we decide to do. Um, like I said, we are going to be finishing Ben's sermon series on royal failures, and so this morning I wanted to read from Psalm 145, which I'm going to actually mention in my ch children's sermon here in a couple minutes. Uh, but I want to read a couple of verses here that talk about the greatness of God our King. Psalm 145 verse 1 says this, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. 
Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing along, uh, sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. A few verses down in verse 13. It says, your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another Sunday morning uh, where the sun is shining and we get to gather here under one roof to exalt your name, to praise your name and uh, find joy and strength and energy in that praise and looking at the God that you are and your greatness and your mighty deeds and that we can find strength in that, that we can find rest in that, that we can bring our weakness, our trouble, our pain um, to your feet and find hope and joy and strength. Lord, there are many, many needs in this congregation, and I pray that we would trust in you, that we would be your hands and feet, that we would be an encouragement to one another, a source of love to one another, and that ultimately we would trust in you and point um, our own hearts and the hearts of others back to you in all that we do. Father, I pray that as we continue, as we move through the service this morning, um, that you would free us from distractions, that you would help us to focus on you as, as beautiful, as lovely, as wonderful, uh, that our hearts would be caught up in all that you are and that you would change us, that you would make us into better people, a better church that better reflects you out into a world that is so in need of godliness and so in need of holy love and holy justice. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for calling us together and bringing us here this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, at this point, I will call the kids forward, the few that are here, and uh, we'll go into our children's sermon. Morning. <laughs> All right, question for you. I've always got a question, right, that I start with. Um, raise your hand if you have ever been to a Colts game. You know, the Colts, the football team, have you ever been to a Colts game? Have, your dad has? Would you, would, have you ever gone to a football game at all? You went to a baseball game? Would you like to go to a Colts game? Would that be, you think that'd be fun? What about you, Theo? Eh, we want to go to the Browns games, right? Yeah, all right. Yeah? All right, so imagine, right, and this is very important that you imagine, because unfortunately this isn't, this isn't going to be true, but imagine that I promised to you that I would take you to a football game, to a Colts game. Would that be exciting? Would you look forward to that? Yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. And now, like I said, we just have to imagine that, because unfortunately it's not true. But what if you were waiting for me to take you to a Colts football game, and while we were waiting, right, because it's not football season, while we're waiting, we found out that the stadium was torn down. The stadium's just destroyed. And we found out that the Colts don't even play football anymore. They're not going to play any more football games. How would you feel about the promise I made to you? Would you feel very good about it? Do you think I could keep that promise? If I promise to you we're going to go watch a Colts football game and their stadium's gone and there's no team, what's going to happen? Yeah, I'm not going to be able to keep my promise, am I? Well, that is a little like what the Jews must have felt in our story today, what we're going to hear about from Pastor Ben. There was a wonderful promise that God had made to them that looked impossible to keep. God had promised to them that someone from King David's family was going to be king forever. But then the Babylonians, can you say Babylonians? Kind of sounds like baloney. Babylonians. 
right? Babylonians, they were a country with a really powerful army. They come in and they go into the kingdom of Judah and they steal the kingdom away. The Babylonians take Judah's king prisoner And they destroy the entire city of Jerusalem. And the city of Jerusalem was where the king's palace was and is where the temple was. It was the most important city in the kingdom. Now, do you remember what God's promise was? What was God's promise to King David? He was going to have, King David would always have someone from his family being the king. Well, how is that going to happen if there's no kingdom? And how could they worship God without a temple? How could they connect with God and be close to God? How could God be their God still with the temple being gone? How could God keep his promise? Doesn't it seem like it's going to be pretty hard for God to keep his promise? So do you think God keeps his promise or not? You don't think he does? He does. You're right. Because God always keeps his promises. You can be sure that God always keeps his promises. The Bible makes it very clear that he is faithful. That means he doesn't break his promises. What he says is true. Psalm 145 verse 13 says, The Lord will keep all his promises. He is faithful in everything he does. So, God has promised a king, but there's no kingdom. And there's no palace, there's no temple. So how does God give a king from David's family to be king forever? Any ideas? You know where the king comes from? (laughs) That's a really good guess. God keeps his promises in and through Jesus. Jesus was born into the family of David. And God made Jesus king. And Jesus is king not over just the kingdom of Judah, not in Jerusalem, but over the whole earth. Jesus' throne isn't in a palace in Jerusalem. It's in heaven, seated next to God the Father. So even in the middle of lots of bad things, when it seemed like God couldn't possibly keep his promise, God was still God, and he was still in control and still keeping his promises. But why did he let the bad things happen? Why do you think God let bad things happen if he was going to keep his promise all along? That God used the bad things to remind his people of who he was. They were looking forward to God's promises, but they'd forgotten that God was the one who promised them. They'd forgotten that the promises were only good because God was going to make them happen. And so, God was showing them that his plans were bigger than what they thought. God was showing them that he was God, that he was in control, that he was the one that was their hope and what they were looking forward to and counting on, and that what they were looking forward to and counting on was much bigger than a little kingdom in Jerusalem. And it was coming through Jesus Christ. It was coming for the whole world. It was coming even for us sitting right here in Fishers, Indiana. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that as we sit in this room, um, you have not changed. You have not changed uh, from yesterday to today. You will not change tomorrow. And as I sit here in front of these little ones, uh, I can have confidence that the God you were for me today, the God you were for me 10 years ago, is the same God you will be for them as they continue to grow, as we continue to grow together. And because you are that same God, because you're faithful, we can have confidence as we go out into the world, as we live our lives with lots of hard things that might happen, lots of confusing things that could come our way. Um, If we know your promises and we know you'll keep them, we can have lots of confidence and lots of trust and lots of joy uh, in the life you've given to us. Um, Help us to trust you when you correct us. Help us to... God, avoid needing correction, that we would give our hearts to you and love you and love our neighbors and, and live a life of service uh, to you and to those around us. God, help us as a church, help me as a pastor, help us as parents, as families, as grandparents, as aunts and uncles, and uh, just individuals to pass on the faith um, because you are a good God, you're a God who doesn't change us, change, and you're a God who is faithful. Lord, I pray that as we 
continue in this service. We would be reminded of that, reminded of your goodness, and take heart in that wonderful truth. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You guys can go back to your seats. Good morning. I just overcame a last minute wardrobe malfunction as I got to sit. I stood up out of my chair and my daughter Sydney looks at me and she says, Mike down. And it was hanging and just dangling behind me. So at the last minute I pushed it in the back of my pocket hoping nobody would notice in course until I tell you about it. So somehow we muddle through each and every morning. Again, my name is uh, Craig. I'm one of the elders here and I want to um, head into our communion um, time this morning. Hey, for those of you who don't know, and it's possible you don't, but I've done a pretty good job socializing this over the years. Um, I work for the grocery store. I work for Meyer. I've been there for, gosh, almost 39 years. And it, I had the privilege last week of getting to teach a profit and loss class to a new group of leaders as we get ready to open a new store in Westfield, Indiana. And what a beautiful location that's going to be. We think it's going to be a big deal. But uh, one of the things that I maybe didn't prepare enough for over the course of that time was the fact that most of the people in that room hadn't been there for 39 years, not 39 months, and not even 39 weeks as I was going through my um, presentation with them. So as I was preparing for communion, I thought, a lot of times I take that for granted as I'm up here as well. As we look around the room, we have some folks who committed their life to Christ many, many, many years ago, and maybe some people who haven't made that commitment yet. So as I was doing some research and going through my preparation, I came across a good article, and it really, it just simply says, why Christians do communion. So I thought I would read from there, tie in some relevant scripture, take us through prayer, and then invite everybody to come up for the elements. So why Christians do communion. It's not about the bread and the wine. It's about the body and the blood of Jesus. It's not about the ritual or the method. It's about listening to Jesus and doing what he says. Communion is not an obligation, but a celebration. Communion celebrates the gospel. Jesus was broken for us so that we can be fixed by him. Celebrating communion marks the story of Jesus, how he gave himself completely to give us a better life, a new start, and a fresh relationship with God. It's not about a ritual to revere, but a person to worship. Jesus is less concerned about the method of celebrating communion and more concerned that we celebrate it. As often as we remember Jesus, we should celebrate Jesus. Communion is important because it's a command to remember. Jesus wants us to remember every time we taste bread and wine, and even when we sit at the tables in our own homes, that he is the one who provides all we need. He gives us the physical food that we need to survive and the spiritual nourishment we need to keep taking our next steps with him. Now I want to read out of 1 Peter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. Please pray with me. Dear Father, um, we come to communion each and every week, um, and this is just the time that we want to remember. We want to remember that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross, a horrible, brutal death, and that he did it for us, so that we, once and for all, can be forgiven of our sins. So Father, as we take the elements this morning, let us be reminded of that. When we take the bread, let us be reminded of Jesus' broken body, when we drink the juice, let us be reminded of his spilled blood, and let us be reminded that he did it for us. Father, we thank you. We love you. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning again. Welcome to Prairie View Christian Church. Thanks for worshiping here with us. Two Sundays ago, we read about one of the greatest disasters in the entire Bible, and that is the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel. After years and years and years of wicked kings, after the sin of idolatry had deeply ingrained itself into Israelite culture and Israelite hearts, and after multiple warnings from multiple prophets, God's judgment on his people finally came. In 722 BC, the nation of Assyria besieged Israel's capital city of Samaria. The people of Israel, God's chosen people, and God's promised land were exiled. The northern kingdom was no more. But as awful and as shocking as this event was, something even worse was coming. The southern kingdom of Judah, generally speaking, had had a better go of things. They had fewer kings. They even had some good kings. Judah wasn't always perfect, but hey, at least they weren't Israel. But then King Manasseh came along and quickly helped Judah catch up to Israel's corruption. He led the people to worship idols and desecrate God's temple. He burned his own son as an offering. He filled Jerusalem, the city of God, with innocent blood. Now Manasseh did eventually repent of his sin, and God showed him mercy. But Manasseh set a chain of events in motion that would lead Judah to the same fate as their Israelite neighbors. Judgment. Exile. But hold on a minute. What about God's faithfulness to King David? You see, long ago, God had made a promise to King David in 2 Samuel 7. He had promised David that he would have a son, and his son's throne would be established forever. His kingdom would be made sure. On top of that, even during Manasseh's worst days, we're reminded of God's faithfulness to David. In 2 Kings 21, verse 7, one of the verses that we read last week, we're reminded that God had chosen Jerusalem. He had put his name on Jerusalem's temple forever. So if Jerusalem falls, if the temple is destroyed, then aren't God's promises to David called into question? And perhaps most importantly, if God is not faithful to his promises to David, how can, we be, how can we be sure that he'll be faithful to his promises to us? So open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 22. Feel free to follow along as we read here in the room and at home as well. But before we go any further, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for your kindness and your mercy and your grace to us. And Lord, thank you for your word. Even when we read difficult passages like we will this morning, thank you for the truths that you teach us, the reminders that you give us, all of which we need on a regular basis. We just took communion, and that's a reminder of who you are and what you've done, and we need that on a regular basis. And Lord, we need your word as well. And so I pray that you would teach us and form us and shape us by your word this morning so that we might know you better, love you more, and honor you more with our words and our deeds and our lives. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for this church, the opportunity we have to worship here together today. I pray that it'd be honoring to you and good for us. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Josiah, Manasseh's grandson, was not a royal failure. In fact, he was Judah's last good king. 
Josiah leads repairs and renovations of the temple. He rediscovers and reveres God's law, holding himself and his people accountable to it for the first time in generations. Josiah repents of his sin. He repents of the nation's sin. He reforms the priesthood and restores the practice of the Passover. And perhaps most significantly, Josiah rejected idolatry more vigorously than any king before him. Josiah burns, beats, breaks down, desecrates, defiles, and removes any sign of the high places that so often tripped Judah up. Josiah is so great, we read in 2 Kings 23, verse 25. Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. That's pretty high praise for Josiah. But sadly... All of Josiah's initiatives and accomplishments, as great as they were, well, they were too little, too late. 2 Kings 23, verse 26. Still the Lord did not turn from the burning of his great wrath, by which his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel, and I will cast off this city that I have chosen, Jerusalem, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. So not even the great King Josiah could right all the wrongs that the nation of Judah had committed. The toothpaste was out of the tube. The genie was out of the bottle. God had justly decided long ago that Judah would be exiled for their sins. And while God did mercifully wait until Josiah was gone to do it, nothing Josiah did in advance could truly stop it. And given what we've read over the past few weeks, honestly, that shouldn't come as a surprise. We read 2 Kings 17 a few weeks ago during the reign of Hosea. Verse 13 says, Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah, not just Israel, but Judah too. He warned them by every prophet and every seer. Judah also, not just Israel, Judah too, did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the customs that Israel had introduced. In 2 Kings chapter 20, King Hezekiah welcomes Babylonian officials into Jerusalem and feels the need to show off all of his treasures. But then the prophet Isaiah warns Hezekiah that one day Babylon will be back, and this time they won't just look. And then last week, we read in 2 Kings 21, 10 through 15, that God would wipe Jerusalem out like a dish. Judah deserved judgment, and there have been multiple previews of it. Quite frankly, it's been a long time coming, which only speaks to the patience and the grace of God. But in today's chapters, God's judgment finally arrives. Now, at the beginning of the sermon, we said that the fall of Judah was a worse disaster than the fall of Israel. Why is that? What makes the fall of Judah so much more disastrous than the fall of Israel? What makes 586 B.C. so much more devastating than 722 B.C.? Well, it comes down to three words. David, Jerusalem, temple. David, Jerusalem, temple. It simply cannot be overstated how central those three words were 
to the imagination, the worldview, the history, the national pride, and the very reason for existence of the Jewish people. There is no comparison, no illustration that can even come close to doing it justice. Losing any of those three things, the promise to David, the city of Jerusalem, or the glorious temple, losing them would be practically, spiritually, politically, and existentially catastrophic. It would call everything the people of Judah ever believed about God, ever believed about themselves, and ever believed about their world into question. If they lose those, then everything they thought, everything they knew, everything they loved would be shaken down to its foundation. And that's exactly what happens. It starts at the end of 2 Kings chapter 23, when a man named Jehoiakim becomes king. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, became a servant of Babylon, and provoked King Nebuchadnezzar's wrath by rebelling against him. And Jerusalem was attacked as a result. Then a man named Jehoiakim becomes king, and really it's the same old song and dance. Only this time, Jehoiakim doesn't even put up a fight against Babylon. The siege of Jerusalem begins in earnest when treasures are taken and people are deported, including Jehoiakim himself. Jerusalem is left bloodied and bruised, but at least it's still standing. But then finally, a man named Zedekiah is appointed king over Judah. And really at this point, appointing new kings is just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Zedekiah, too, rebels against Babylon, but this time Nebuchadnezzar runs out of patience. That's when we get to the faithful chapter, 2 Kings 25, starting in verse 1. And in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, which, as we've said before, anytime you're reading the Bible and you see something presented like that, you know what's about to happen is very important. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And they built siege works all around it. So the city was besieged till the 11th year of King Zedekiah. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Then a breach was made in the city, and all the men of war fled by night by the way of the gate between the two walls, by the king's garden, and the Chaldeans were around the city. Chaldeans, another word for Babylonians. And they went in the direction of the Arabah. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they passed sentence on him. They slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and bound him in chains, and took him to Babylon. In the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, That was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. And he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. And all the army of the Chaldeans, who were with the captain of the guard, broke down the walls around Jerusalem. And the rest of the people who were left in the city, and the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon, together with the rest of the multitude, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, carried into exile. But the captain of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. Jumping ahead to verse 18. And the captain of the guard took Sariah, the chief priest, 
and Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three keepers of the threshold. And from the city he took an officer who had been in command of the men of war, and five men of the king's council who were found in the city, and the secretary of the commander of the army who mustered the people of the land, and sixty men of the people of the land who were found in the city. And Nebuzaradan, and the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And the king of Babylon struck them down and put them to death at Riblah in the land of Hamath. So Judah was taken into exile out of its land. In short, the unthinkable has happened. Judah has fallen. David's throne is now vacant. The chosen city is now ransacked. God's temple is now destroyed. The prophets had warned them, but they didn't listen. Hezekiah saw it coming, but it wasn't his problem. Manasseh repented, but the nation didn't. Josiah tried to raise Judah better, but his pleading they denied. That leaves only Judah to blame because Josiah tried. So, so much for God's faithfulness, right? So much for God's promises, right? They're buried in the dust of an empty throne, a smoldering city, an obliterated temple. Can God be trusted after that? But what do we learn from such a horrible tragedy of such biblical proportions? What do we take away from one of the darkest moments in all of Scripture? Well, a few lessons. First, God's people can look back on this event as a cautionary tale against the sins of spiritual laziness, a sense of entitlement, and arrogance. For years leading up to this event, the people of Judah were convinced that what happened to Israel could never happen to them, no matter how wicked they got. Why? Those three words we mentioned earlier. David. Jerusalem. Temple. They were on David's side. They were in the chosen city of Jerusalem. They had the only real, true, original temple of God's presence. What happened up north wouldn't happen to them. They weren't going to be exiled. God would never treat them that way. And while, in a sense, those three things were true, they were on David's side, they were in Jerusalem, they did have the temple. The people of Judah allowed themselves to get complacent. They became half hearted in their worship, their obedience, and their love. They convinced themselves that they could deny, reject, provoke, and abandon God without consequence. They had a fallback plan, they had a get out of exile free card. They had three of them. In short, the people of Judah took God's kindness to them for granted, and they were judged for it. We Christians are not immune or exempt from the same temptation. Spiritual laziness, a sense of entitlement, and arrogance. I raised my hand. I said the prayer. I got dunked in the water. I write my checks. As long as I jump through the hoops, perform the right rituals, and put on a nice show, then I'm in good shape. We too can find ourselves getting complacent and half-hearted in our love for God to the point of taking his kindness to us. Bought with nothing less than the body and blood of Jesus Christ, we can take it for granted. That's why the Apostle Paul reminds believers in Galatians 5, verse 13, not to use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. He also reminds us in Romans 6 that God's grace to us is not our license to pursue sin, 
not our license to get away with sin. God's grace to us is the very basis, the very motivation for our pursuit of holiness. The kindness that God has shown us through Jesus Christ ought not to lead us to spiritual laziness, a sense of entitlement, or arrogance. It leads us to a growing sense of humility, gratitude, and worship. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two is this. We can look back at this event and be reminded that God sometimes sees it fit to discipline his people. As horrific as this event was for Judah, they deserved it. They had plenty of warnings. God gave them more than enough time to repent. And really, they should have known better. Thus, God had every right to allow or even directly cause his people to face the consequences of their actions. But hold on. What about God's grace? What about God's love? What about God's mercy? I mean, the word discipline doesn't exactly bring those attributes of God to mind, does it? Well, Christians can be confident that while God's discipline may be painful, he does not discipline us for the sake of our complete and utter destruction. He disciplines us because he loves us. He disciplines us because it's for our good. It's for our purity. It's for our repentance. This short-term suffering is for our long-term growth. As we read in Hebrews chapter 12, God disciplines us because he is a loving father so that we may share in his holiness and yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So lesson number one, it's a cautionary tale against the temptation of spiritual laziness. Lesson number two, this story reminds us that God sometimes disciplines his people. Lesson number three, the story can remind us that there will be a day of judgment. For the nation of Judah, 586 B.C. must have felt like nothing less than a day of judgment. They were called to the carpet for their sins, and they were punished. For generations, they had forgotten that there was a God they must answer to. They lived as if there wasn't, and they got a rude awakening when Babylon showed up at their gates, and they remembered that there was. I'm sure those people were shocked, though really they shouldn't have been. Likewise, believers in Jesus know that one day all humanity will answer to God. Christ will return in power and glory as king and judge. Of course, we have confidence that we will stand in that day of judgment. Not because of anything in us, but by faith in Jesus' broken body and shed blood on the cross. For Christians, the day of judgment is not something that we dread. It's something that we eagerly and even joyfully await. But we still must be ready. As Jesus warns his disciples in Matthew 24 and 25, we must stay awake. We must keep watch. We must make good use of the time. We don't want to be caught napping like Judah. But once again, coming back to the question we asked at the beginning of the sermon, what do we make of God's faithfulness to David from this passage? I mean, are we just going to overlook the fact that apparently God's promises weren't all that reliable after all? Really, that may be the biggest question this biblical event raises. And the answer may be important, more important, than anything else we've talked about today. Does God keep his promises or not? Can God's word be trusted or not? 
If the answer is no, then those three lessons we just talked about, they lose their significance. And though it may be hard to see through the wreckage of 2 Kings 25, the answer is a resounding yes. God does keep his promises. God's word can be trusted. God is faithful. You see, God's people in both Israel and Judah would not be completely annihilated. They wouldn't be exiled forever. The walls of Jerusalem would eventually be rebuilt. God's temple would stand again, though not in its former glory. But that's only two out of three. What about David? What about David's throne? You see, even after all those other sufferings are past, David's throne would remain empty. And if that's the case, does that mean God has failed? Again, the answer is no. Because there would be another Davidic king. And his name is Jesus Christ. And as we'll see over the next two weeks, Palm Sunday and Easter, Jesus would not reign in the same way that David, Solomon, or any other king of Israel or Judah ever did. And you know, maybe that's okay. Because in one way or another, all those other kings, they were royal failures. But this king will be different. This king will be better. He will lead God's people to a better city. He will lead us to a better temple. And he'll lead us there from a very different kind of throne. One shaped like a cross that leads to a tomb, but ultimately ends with him sitting at the right hand of the Father. This city will come down from heaven. And there won't be a temple of God's presence in that city, because God will be so close that a temple isn't needed. And all the marks of the royal failures... All the marks of this fallen world in which they rule and reign, and we live and we suffer. Tears, death, mourning, crying, pain, destruction, sin, and Satan. In that better city, with that better temple, and that better king, they will be no more. All who believe in this king the Son of David, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, will be welcome. And he will never fail. His kingdom will never fall. And those in his kingdom will never be exiled. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the promises that you made to David, that you kept, even if it wasn't always easy to see how or when or where. But Lord, you kept your promises to David. And Lord, thank you that we are beneficiaries as well of your promises to David. Those promises that you issued way back in the Old Testament, dating all the way back to the first chapters of the Bible, Promises to Adam and Eve, promises to Abraham, promises to David, promises to Moses. Those promises aren't just good for people from a long time ago, people in a very different world, people in a very different area of the planet. Those promises are good for all mankind. We are all beneficiaries of your promises. And because you have kept your promises to David, we can trust that you will keep your promises to us. You promise that by the body and blood of Christ, we will be saved in the day of judgment. You promise that 
By the body and blood of Christ, our sins are forgiven. You promise by the body and blood of Christ that we are reconciled to you. And Lord, you are a God who keeps your promises. You've proven it over and over and over again, even when things seem to be falling apart, even when chaos seemed to reign, even when destruction was everywhere, you've kept your promises. And so, Lord, help us trust you, help us obey you, worship you, follow you, and love you, knowing that we have promises to look forward to in eternity. So help us not lose heart, help us not give up, strengthen us by your Holy Spirit, preserve us and sustain us until we see our new king face to face, until we dwell in that new city that comes down from heaven, until we stand in your presence forever where no temple is needed because you are there. We love you, we honor you, we worship you. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy
grace is more Grace is found Is where you That concludes our service for this morning, March 21st, 2021. Uh, a couple of things to mention really quickly. Uh, you may have noticed my fashionable March Madness mask. Uh, the reason I have one of these highly coveted masks is because our own Kim Kors gave it to me. Uh, and it's also worth mentioning that Kim Kors is in first place in our bracket challenge. So keep it going, Kim. Uh, I think my two kids have picked just about every single upset that's happened. Uh, they picked North Texas, they picked Ohio, they picked Oral Roberts, so uh, they're in good shape. But Kim's in first. Uh, now, as Zach mentioned earlier in the service as well, uh, we are hopefully getting to a point uh, where, in the near future, uh, accessorizing masks with logos and designs might not be as much of an issue, might not be as much of a thing. Uh, we certainly cannot commit to anything at this point, but as Zach mentioned earlier in the service, we do just want you to know that what you're seeing right now and what we've been doing for the past nine months, we are not resigning ourselves to doing this forever. Uh, we have not been guilty of Stockholm Syndrome, and we've actually grown to love the precautions that we're under. We don't love these precautions, and we're just as ready as anybody to get rid of some of this stuff and do some things differently. Uh, however, we're not going to be too quick to the trigger about that. We certainly don't want to be unwise about that. And so we know that lots of people are paying attention to what this state is doing and what that state is doing and what this church is doing and what that church is doing. And trust us, we get it. Uh, we're ready to move to a different phase of this whole experience as well. And those conversations are happening. Uh, so just know that those conversations are happening. Know that we're not going to do this forever. Uh, and certainly pay attention in the coming weeks and months as we start to figure out what the future is going to look like with COVID and how to move forward. So with that, that'll close our service for today. Uh, if you have any questions about who we are, what we do, questions about our Lord, of course, then feel free to ask me, ask Zach, Mark, our elders. We would love to talk with you and pray with you and answer those questions. So with that, I'll close us in prayer, and we hope you have a great week ahead. Father, again, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we've had together to worship you and I pray it was honoring to you uh, more than anything else. Uh, every week we come in here, we want to enjoy our time together, and we want to benefit from it, and we want to see people and laugh and talk and catch up, and all of that stuff is absolutely essential. Uh, it's part of 
being a church. It's part of being a body of believers. But at the end of the day, the most important thing about every Sunday, uh, the most important question we can ask ourselves is, were you glorified? And so, Lord, I pray that you were glorified this morning through what we've said and sung and what we've done. And Lord, I ask that you watch over us in the week ahead, wherever you send us, wherever we go, whatever it is that we do, I pray that we would glorify you and honor you. I pray that you would care for us, protect us, and that, Lord, we would trust you to do those things, uh, that we would trust that you are a faithful God who keeps your promises and that you can be trusted, even when things fall apart, even when life is hard, even when it feels like we're being disciplined and, and suffering, Lord. I pray that we would trust in you, trust in your promises, and trust that you are our good Father who loves us. We glorify you, we praise you, we ask this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great Sunday.